Welcome, welcome to Thrive. This is an entrepreneur series, and today we're going to be talking about closing sales successfully. Uh, your host today is going to be Ruth Ann Bowen. Ruth Ann is the co founder and CMO of uh, an amazing digital agency known as East Camp Creative. Uh, so, Ruth Ann, will you welcome? Uh, you're going to be our host. You want to tell us a little bit more about you? Absolutely. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for having us here today to talk about how to better close sales. As Brett said, I am Ruth Ann Bowen and I am the Chief Marketing Officer at East Camp Creative, where we navigate your business to success online with high performing websites that grow your business. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can visit us at eastcampcreative.com. And our guest today is Steve Kelly who is the president of Excellist. He's a Sandler trainer, and he has been working in the sales and marketing field for over 27 years. So he, my friends, is an expert when it comes to learning how to close sales. So Steve, hello, thank you for being here. Anything you wanna add about yourself? No, Ruthann, thanks Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm just excited to talk to, to you and have a good time and a good conversation through uh, and share with the people that are, that are uh, joining in and, and see absolutely. if we can help some people. Yeah, absolutely. Cause at the end of the day, that is what it's all about. So we are, ears are open. Our minds are open. We want to learn everything that you can teach us in regards to how we can better close our sales, make the sale. So I'm actually just gonna dive right in and start asking you some questions because sure. um, the, let me just give you a little bit of background um, on how we even started this conversation. So as a small business owner, most of us freelancers, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, we're running our own service business, sales-based businesses, and we're really good at what we do. We're really good designers. We're really good graphic designers. We're really good web designers. We're really good at our craft. However, it takes a separate skill set, I believe, for sales when it comes to selling what we do. And I think there are a lot of boundaries there. There are a lot of fears. There are a lot of um, hurdles that we need to overcome in order to grow our own businesses as salespeople. Because at the end of the day, we have to recognize that indeed every one of us is a salesperson of some kind so given the landscape that we have right now with the advent of COVID-19 in the beginning of the year how do we prospect now how do we go about finding I mean this is the initial question how do we go about finding quality people for clients any tips for us on that you know, sure, there's a number of things we could talk about as it relates to prospecting, but, you know, Ruthann, you're not alone, right? I, I work with a lot of small entrepreneurs and, and bigger companies as well, and it, it's pretty common that they love to do what they do, right? Everybody loves, if they're a graphic designer, they love doing that, and it's great. Um, it's only when they realize, oh, geez, I have, I have two other hats I should be wearing. One is a prospecting hat, and one is a sales hat. And, and that prospecting hat, as you said, from COVID is, has changed somewhat. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the people I talked to have said, you know, I, I used to love going to networking events. And, and that's how I got all my clients. I'd, I'd go to a networking event and I'd have some good conversations and that would lead to a future business. You know, what do I do now? And I think that's, I think that's a challenge that a lot of us face. But I think I, it starts with understanding what prospecting is. Right, prospecting is fi about finding a person to have a conversation with. And there are a lot of ways you can find uh, to have conversations. Um, you, can, you can do phone calls, right? No one, no one likes doing cold calls, but you can, do, you can do phone calls. You can go for referrals. You can look at uh, emails, in-mails, uh, speaking engagements like, like what we're doing here is an opportunity those are all channels or, or avenues to prospect. I think the big key is having a plan, right? Have a plan around how you're gonna prospect and, and really focus on that plan, that first part. Um, we often talk about it as if it was a cookbook. Have a, have a couple recipes in your cookbook that, that you can use to find your prospects to talk to. I'm sure Ruthann, for you, you, you probably do a lot of different things to, to find new 
new prospects, right? We have different channels that we use, absolutely. But this cookbook thing has me intrigued. What exactly is in that cookbook? Like, do you have sure. sales spiels? Which I even hate to use that word because it sounds so salesy. But, yeah. you know, what do you actually say to somebody? Like, let's say I'm going to do this cold call, right? Which, oh my gosh, okay, that's a whole topic in and of itself. Yeah. I hate sure. cold calling. Hate it. Yeah. Like I'll pass that off to my 20 year old and say, Hey, here's, here's some websites that I think need to be redone. You call, right? Sure. Sure. So I don't really want to do that because he's not a salesperson either. But how do we overcome that fear of even just picking up the call, picking up the phone to make the call? You know, it's funny, Ruth, and you said something in the, in the middle of all that, that, that really keyed into my head. And I think a lot of people like you face, and that is the word sales, right? This idea that I sound salesy. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of talks and, and one of the questions I always ask people is how many people when they were growing up did their parents look at them and say, you should be a salesperson. And I might get one hand out of 20, right? And, and the question is always, well, why is that? And, and what you find is we, we, we tend to have a connotation of what sales is about and what it is to be a salesperson and what it means to be salesy. And I think you have to overcome that, that idea of being quote unquote salesy. Um, you have to kind of get that into, into the right perspective so that you can start to do things like cold calling, right? And, and get rid of all that. We use the word head trash all the time, all that head trash that keeps, gets in your way of, of doing things. So, uh, you know, the first, first step for, for most people is to recognize that you don't have to sound salesy to be effective in selling. Um, and that there are, there are strategies and ways to do that. Um, okay. to, your, to your question about the cookbook, uh, a cookbook for us is, is very similar to the idea of a, of a, of a cookbook that, that I got when I graduated from college years ago, right? That Betty Crocker cookbook that's this big and has only two pages dog-eared because that's the only two things I know how to cook. But, yep. Right? But what, what's, a, what's a recipe? What's in a cookbook? What's in a cookbook right now? A recipe which I am recipe dependent, <clears throat> by the way. <clears throat> I can't cook without a recipe. You can't cook Some without a recipe. So, yeah, so what's in a recipe? What's in a recipe? All the ingredients, and then not only just the ingredients, but also the instructions. So the ingredients, right, what you, what you need. If you have to do prep work, it might have, hey, you gotta prep the food this way, right? What else does it have? Servings, how many servings you could get, right? It has a serving size might have a picture of what it should look like. It might have, okay, you're ready to cook. How do I do the steps of cooking? Well, first I, I look at the, at the name of the person I'm going to call. And then I, I look at my script of, of what I want to say when I'm on the call. And then I'm going to dial the number. And then I'm going to go through my script this way. And I'm going to make sure that I do these certain steps, right? And if I do that well enough and I do enough and I do enough prep work, I'm going to create so many servings or I'm going to create so many conversations, right? It's that idea of how do I, how do I know the right steps to create conversations with prospects? Because I know if I have enough conversations with prospects, some of those will lead to meetings. Some of those meetings will lead to proposals and, and business and, and so on. Okay. So that's why we use so the cookbook. All right, so um, say I'm picking up the phone to call somebody yep. and I'm introducing myself mm -hmm. and I can tell on the other end of the line, they are not interested in what I have to say. So what do I do at that point? Well, question, question for you. And I, I warned you when we were preparing for this, I was gonna ask you questions, right? Cause I don't wanna just give you answers. I'm not trying to mind read what you're thinking. Right. The question is how, how do you know they're not, they're not interested? Because you can tell by the tone of their voice sure. or the, uh, like I, when I, this way before, um, when I was working in PR, which is also a form of sales, by the way, sure. I was calling a, an editor and um, was, I had a book that I was hired to publicize and I literally cold called the guy. And on the other end, he literally says this to me, Ugh. I hate these kind of calls. 
And that's how I feel sometimes people respond to a cold call when it comes to even selling our web design businesses. Like, you yep. know, they're busy. It's not high priority for them. Yada, yada, yada. So, yep. you know, how do I know? I can tell by the tone of their voice, mm -hmm. their objections, what have you. You just know. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and do you think they know when you call that, that they're getting a cold call? How quickly do you think they, they recognize, oh, no, it's a cold call? How fast do you think that is? ASAP. It's within seconds, right? You pick up the phone and you hear something, you hear a pattern, right? And it sounds something like, hi, Ruthann, it's Steve. Hi, how are you doing today? Hey, do you have a few minutes? Let me, let me, right? And it has a sound to it. Our prospects have learned over the years that when they pick up a phone, it has a certain sound when it's a cold call, right? It has that salesy sound right? Almost a, a disingenuous sound. So part of the challenge with cold call is not having that salesy sound, right? To be genuine with them, to be, to almost break the pattern so that they stop and actually listen to you for a second, right? And they, they, you've earned the right to have a, a couple seconds of conversation with them. That being said, if there isn't a fit, if it isn't a good client, Go back to what's the, what's the job of prospecting? It's to find people to talk to. It's not to convince people to talk to you, right? Or to, or to trick them or to, or to force them into talking to you. It's really going through that needle and haystack. I just made a phone call. Is this a straw or is it a needle? I don't know. I have to have some sort of dialogue with the person. And so I want to make sure that I break that initial pattern of, oh my gosh, it's a cold call right? Or it's more importantly, oh my gosh, it's a typical salesperson. So I'm going to break that pattern by being disarmingly honest and genuine. Um, but then I need, to, I need to figure out, is this a straw or is it a needle? And if it's a straw, I, there's, there's plenty of needles out there. I don't need to try to convince every piece of straw that it's a needle, right? That's not the, right. That's not the job of a cold call. It's not to convince people of anything, right? And that's a good light bulb moment for me because I think we approach it with that idea that we have to convince them. Like we we picture the end of the call hanging up going, yeah, I got the sale. When in reality, what you're saying is that's not the point of the call. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, no. First off, I, I wouldn't try to sell anybody anything on a cold call, right? On a cold call, it's about is there a connection? Is there a need that I might be able to fix? And is it worth having a further conversation? Right. Yeah. I'm not going to try to sell somebody a cold call. I'm going to try to find out if I can, if, if we collectively, meaning me and them decide that it makes sense to have another conversation. Um, that's really gotcha. the objective, right? It's not to sell them, but you're right. We sometimes get, we sometimes get fixated on this idea of, Oh my gosh, I have to have everyone turn into, a sale, a turn into something. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets, I think that gets to this, the idea of your attitude walking into the sales call in the first place or into the cold call, right? If you go into it with an attitude of limitations or scarcity mentality, you sometimes do pick up that, whether consciously or subconsciously, you pick up a little bit of that, oh my gosh, I need this. I need it, right? And Instead of saying, well, I'm going to make a hundred dials per the chat. I'm going to make a hundred dials in that hundred dials. I may only get 10 or 20 people that actually answer the phone. And of that 10 or 20, depending on what I'm selling, I may only get two to two to five people say, yeah, let's have a meeting. Right. I have to go into it knowing that that's okay. That I'm doing the behavior right? And that there's plenty out there. The minute I start feeling like there's a scarcity mentality, whether I know it or not, it shows in my voice, right? My tonality Absolutely. changes. The, the way I do things change. And then I start to sound desperate. And then I sound desperate. It's, it's, I'm fighting an uphill battle. Right. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Much, much better to have the abundance mindset for sure. So let's talk a little bit. Okay, so cold calling is, is one way. Definitely of, one way, that's right. 
that's yeah, all you that's, so I hear a lot about relationship marketing. How does relationship work for us in gaining more sales and gaining more prospecting? Yeah, yeah. far and away, right? The, the, the best way to, to um, get, a, get a lead or get a prospect is, is from other people that you know, from referrals. Um, and, and so I, I spend a lot of time with my, with my clients talking about their referral strategy. How, how do they go about approaching referrals and generating referrals from their existing clients, from their partners? You know, you and I work together because we have collaborative industries. How do we work together to find referrals for each other when we're calling on similar customers? So there's a number of different ways that you can leverage um, the idea of creating my referral tree, um, that tree of places that I can, I can start to pull referrals from. Again, it's existing clients, it's, it's future clients, or sorry, past clients. It's referral partners like yourself. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can leverage that referral tree and a lot of different vehicles nowadays, right? So we have LinkedIn, um, there's other, other ways, email. Um, there's not just the phone call method to, to kind of work and, and develop those referral trees. And, and it's all based on relationships, right? It's creating a relationship for mutual gain. Um, I have to build social capital with you. I have to show relevance or add value to the conversations that you and I have. I have to give more than I expect to get back, right? Uh, I think it was Emerson's law of compensation, right? The more you give, the more that comes back to you, right? So I have to have that mentality that I don't diminish my own capital or my own, my own value by helping you do more in your space. Mm -hmm. Right, and exactly. I think that's important for all of us. Yeah, yes. I think it's important Absolutely. for all of us to have that, that mentality. Absolutely, givers gain. So um, a lot of us as Wix partners are in the marketplace, the Wix marketplace, mm -hmm. and we do get leads from there, warm sure. leads, um, people from a variety of spaces, um, need a brand new website to, it's been up for a long time, but we need a redesign variety of budgets, zero to thousands of dollars. When we respond to those leads in the marketplace, we either get an email address for the person or a phone number. Okay. Um, what would your recommendation be the best way reaching out to them and closing those warm leads? What, what would your recommendation be? How do we do that? Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of, of picking up the phone. Um, if, if you have a phone number and you can reach out to somebody via the phone, I, I would highly recommend uh, doing that. You know, when we get into, when you're, when you're trying to make a connection with a prospect, um, there's, there's three elements, right, of, of communication that come through. Now we have Zoom, so you can see me using my hands, you can see my body language, but you can also hear my tonality and you can hear the words I use. Um, if you resort to email, uh, text, all those kind of things, you lose out on tonality and body language um, that I think are extremely important in communicating a message and more importantly, hearing your prospect better, right? Hearing what they're truly saying. Too often we, we, I joked about mind reading early on, too often we mind read about what we think they need or what we think their problem is and we respond accordingly. Um, you, you need those other those other cues, the tonality, the body language, they really help you decode what it is they're asking for, mm -hmm. right? So that you can, you can do that. So for me, Ruthann, if you were to get to, I'd say, start with a phone call. Start with a phone call, make an introduction, have a good script with you, um, and then follow up with an email should you go to, you know, if you wrote a voicemail or something like that. But So what, what would you recommend as, what would you recommend in that script? What kind of questions or sure. power words? What are we saying when we get that person on the phone? Uh, I'm not sure that I would use power words as an example. That's a, that's a, I'm not even sure I know what a power word is, but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. You, you is a power word. You is a power word. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, it's, it's a great question because I think it, it gets to this idea of what am I really trying to do? When, when you're reaching out to that prospect, right? For whatever reason, they, 
they said some kind of inbound lead to you and you, you, you got something that said, well, I, I think I need a new website. I need to be able to do e-commerce. I need to blot whatever it is, right? What are you trying to figure out when you call them? Let's say we're then you pick up the phone, you go, hey, hey, Steve, I got a question for you. What, what are you really trying to figure out when you call them? What do you want to know? What do you think? Well, I'm trying to figure out, are they a good client for me? Are, are they, they a good, a good fit? fit? Yeah, are they a good fit? So how do you do that? How do you figure out if they're well, a good fit? I ask questions, but maybe they're not the right questions. So what questions would you ask? <laughs> Uh, so I think you're on the right, you're on the right hunt, right? It's about asking questions. It's about asking questions to figure out, do they really have a problem, an actionable problem that I can solve? I think, I think that it, it starts there, right? In that first conversation with them, um, you're, you're really trying to figure out, is this somebody that I can help? And, and the only way to really do that effectively is to ask a bunch of questions. Right? It's to yeah. ask questions and, and continue to ask questions until you get to a level of clarity that you, you think you've come across what's the real root problem, right? The real root cause. Um, and, and generally that's, that's things like um, um, what impact does it have to their business? That whatever the challenge is, if you can quantify down to the impact to their business, right? True dollars and cents. And, and just as importantly, if you, can, if you can ask questions to qualify what it is to them personally, right? Uh, for people to do something, right? To have really, we call it in the Sandler world, we call it pain. It's really an emotionally compelling reason to do something different. Well, that first step for you is about what is that emotionally compelling reason? Does it exist? And if it doesn't exist, Ruth, what do you do? If they don't have that, what do you do? You make it for them. You no. tell them what they're. <laughs> no, you don't tell. You not. This isn't like a game of, uh, you know, cup thing where you're trying to trick them. No, if, right. if they don't have a mo an emotionally compelling reason or an actionable thing that you can fix, right? If somebody came to me and said, "Hey, Steve, I need a new website," and you know what, we're using Salesforce.com, and I need your help to to integrate Salesforce into the website. I'd say, boy, that sounds like an important problem for you. I can't help you with that, right? Not that they're a good person or a bad person, but for me, they're not gonna be a qualified lead, right? Mm -hmm. So part of my challenge or part of my role in that first phone call is, are they qualified, right? Are they really qualified? Do they have an actionable pain for me? And, and not so much right. that I tell them what their pain is, but can I help them self-discover what that is? And, and it's a successful first step. If, if, if we can together uncover or discover what that emotionally compelling reason is to do something, that's a good first step to qualifying them. It's not the last step though. There's sure, no and we're, we'll get to that. But this part of the conversation this part of the and conversation. if you've just joined us, we're talking with Steve Kelly of Excelist. Yeah, this part of the conversation is the engagement part of the conversation. So we were talking previously about finding your prospects. Now we're talking sure. about engaging the prospect when you have them in that conversation. So some of the things that I come up against personally when I'm on the phone with people is, you know, the budget question. Sure. Um, and we'll throw out a number, let's say, and nine times out of 10, this is what I get back. Well, I just talked with so-and-so and he's a whole lot cheaper. And I looked at his work and it's just as good. Well, in their yep. opinion, it's just as good. So how do you overcome the price point war, bidding war? How do you overcome those objections? So, you know, sure, you can get that cheaper. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we overcome that objection? Uh, it, so it's funny. Uh, the, the budget question is one of those things that, or the budget discussion, it, it's either one of those things that salespeople never want to touch, right? So they, they ignore it till the very end and then they give their proposal and it has a price in it. Um, or they end up talking about it very, very early in the conversation. Uh, the real key with the budget question is to understand the, the flow of the conversation. 
when you talk about budget, ideally, who, who, who throws out the budget number? What, what the budget concept, is it you giving them a number or them giving you a number? What do you think about that? Well, first, in my conversation, what's that? At the first pass. Oh, okay. Well, typically I'm asking them, what's your budget range? Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest misses that a lot of salespeople uh, avoid or just don't know to do, right? Is that first question is, what is, what is your budget, Mr. Prospect or Ms. Prospect? What's your budget? What's your budget for this project? Now, the other, uh, the other component of this is, let's say you're doing a big web, website design change, right? You're, you have a prospect that is um, going through a bunch of changes and they're really going to revamp the website and it, we're at ground zero. And they come to you and they say, Ruthann, we want to do this big change and um, uh, here, here's what we want to do. When you ask them the, ask them the budget question, is it just about money? Is that the only thing they have to be willing and able to, to invest, do you think? Or is there more to it than money for them? In their mind, I think the, it will, it kind of depends on the person, but for most of them, it's that dollar sign. Sure, so they, they certainly think of money. One of the other things that I, I encourage a lot of my clients to do is have the conversation with their prospects early on about budget. It's, it's about what the customer's willing and able to do, right? And it's about what they're willing and able to do, but it's not just money. In, in the scenario I painted for you, right? Are they gonna have to provide a lot of brain power and input to you as, as you go through the process? Yeah, right? They're gonna have yeah. to give you input. They're gonna have to be available to provide, provide information. Maybe they're providing other data sources. There's a lot of other things they have to be willing and able and that's really the budget discussion. Willing, they have to be willing and they have to be able to spend money for sure. But there's other components to the discussion that we sometimes skip over or not talk about at all that in many cases are more important than the money question. So the first step to this whole money thing is you have to ask the question about what's in their budget, what they're willing to do. I, I know your work. I know how high end it can be. But I also know that if somebody said, hey, look, I have a limited budget and here's what I want to get done, that you, 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 would, you might be able to find a way to help them as well, right? It wouldn't have to be the, the, the big, beautiful stuff that I've seen you guys do. Knowing that question, asking that up front helps you craft better what your answer is going to be, right? You're going to build it to what they can afford. So I think that's the first step, but, but it's also helping the customer recognize that it's not all about money that there are other components that they have to be willing and able to invest in. And so that really, when we talked about having actionable pain being that first step of qualification, the second step of qualification for a prospect is, are they willing and able to invest or commit to the solution that you have in mind for them? Are they willing and able to do that, right? If you have a, if you have a prospect that has no money, it's going to be tough for them to be willing and able to, 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 to use your services, right? They might be great people, but they're not qualified. They don't, have, they don't have the budget, right? They don't have the dollars. Likewise, if you had a prospect that said, look, I want to do this, but, and I'll pay you money, but I, I don't want to have to be involved at all. I don't want any input. I just want to see it when it's done. Well, you and I both know that that's probably a recipe for disaster, right? That they're going to get it and go, oh, this is horrible. This isn't what I wanted at all. So you rightly would say, well, look, I'm not sure that's going to work. Right? You have to be willing and able to provide input in a timely and, and effective manner as well. So I, the first step of this budget question is really having those kinds of discussions in an open, transparent, you know, matter of fact, business person to business person discussion. Mm -hmm. um, While maintaining an abundance step. mindset. Say again, I'm sorry. While maintaining an abundance mindset. You can't lose something you don't already have, right? There you go. If, 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 you, if, you, if you say to yourself, I can't talk to them about the money um, because what if, they, what, if they, what if they say no? What if they do this? What if they do that? Well, would you rather find out mm -hmm. that they're not willing and able to invest early in the process before you've put a lot of effort and time into it? 
or after you've created a big, beautiful proposal that frankly gives them everything they need to know for free, I might add, we call it unpaid consulting, without any sense of commitment from them that there's even a budget there that would support what you're trying to do. Mm. So this, this gets to your, your other point, right? Too often we jump to the money and what we're going to charge before we truly understand what they're willing and able to invest to and before we truly understand what the real problem is, right? It, it starts with what's the real problem? What's that real problem mean to them personally and what's it mean to them financially to their business? then you can have the budget discussion about what they're willing to do to fix that. Once you understand what they're willing to do to fix it and you know what the problem is, then you can take a step back and say, A, are they qualified? Meaning they have a problem I can solve and they have money that I'm comfortable with. And, and then decide, well, what is it I can do for them? How am I, how am I gonna put that and translate that into a real proposal? Right, and at which point you have the information you need that if you're grossly over the budget they gave you, well, then you probably weren't listening very carefully in the budget step, mm -hmm. right? Good point. It should yeah. almost be a no-brainer at that point. I know what the problem is, I know how to solve it, I know how much they're willing and able to invest to fix it. All I need to know then is the third step of qualification, which is how are they gonna make the decision? Right, so your, your, your question started with, um, uh, well, what if they say the other guy was 10 cents cheaper? Part of the third step of qualification is what we call the decision step. It's understanding how they're going to make the decision. Are they going to base their decision solely on price? If they are, maybe that's not a client you want to deal with. Right? Like, once, again, once again, they're not qualified. Right? Right. Now, to your, your abundance comment, comment before, if you go at everything as, oh my gosh, I have to get this one, right? You're liable to skip over and just throw something out to them in a proposal, um, as opposed to truly understand whether or not you should be bothering with them at all. And yeah. that's where the abundance mentality becomes so important. Mm -hmm. Especially and I think what you're talking about, sorry. I think what you're talking about is understanding the scope of the project. Because um, sure. understanding that scope really helps you nail the, a, a better price for value. Because at the end of the day, we're not charging for time. We're charging for all of the expertise and value that we bring to the business. And I think a lot of times the client on the other end isn't seeing that part of the picture. All they're seeing is that number. You know, they get very fixated on the number. So what I hear you saying is, you know, understanding how that, how you can provide the solution to that pain point for them and the value that that's going to be for them at the end of the day. And are they willing to make the investment that it's going to take to fix that problem? Uh, and I, I think that last point's the key point, Ruthann, is um, we're all in business to, to grow our business and, and to do, to deliver a fair product for a fair price. Um, and you have to understand what they're, what they're able to do, right? You and I have both worked with very small customers or prospects who have had very little budget, right? And we have to understand that if we're gonna understand how they're gonna do it. Um, when we've, we've both worked with bigger clients that have big budgets, right? In either case, they have an expectation of what they wanna spend or what they can and can spend. We have to understand that if we're gonna understand whether or not they're qualified, mm -hmm. right? And it's only when after we're sure they're qualified that we go on and, and really tell them what it is we can do to help them, right? Yeah. We don't tell them ahead of time, right? That's unpaid consulting. Um, they're liable to take that. And I know this never happens to you, but sometimes it happens to some people that they take all that great information you gave them and they walk over to your competitor and say, hey, you know, I have this great idea. Why don't you try doing it this way? And they share that information with them. And, and, and you oh, walk yeah. away with, with nothing in your hands. Yeah, and that's a tragedy. It does happen though, it is reality. I have a question here, just very quickly. Yeah. Uh, what, what would be a recommendation of dealing with leads and setting yourself apart? Okay, so this is what happens, just so right. you understand in the Wix marketplace, 
once a lead is um, put through the system, it gets sent to six different designers. So okay. potentially that client would be getting six different responses from six different designers. How do we set ourselves apart so that we win the sale? Uh, so uh, for five of you, put, turn, your, turn your computer off for, for a minute. For the one that we're going to talk to, um, just listen up. Here, here's the thing. Don't sound like all, don't sound like the other five people, right? They're not listening. So it's okay. Don't sound like them, right? You, you need to sound unsalesy. You have to come at it with a sense of, of business to business relationship. You have to ask really good questions. You have to really get to a point where you truly understand what their pain is and that you've helped them uncover what the real problems are. The best salespeople, when they finish a meeting with a, a prospect, the prospect says, wow, I, that's a, those are great questions. I, I didn't realize, I, didn't, I just didn't realize, I, I've learned so much. And in truth, if you've done it well, you haven't told them anything other than ask them questions and help them self-discover. So if you wanna stand out from other people, don't sound like them. Ask great questions. Learn how to ask questions that help lead the client to self-discovery, to lead the client to understand what the problems are, to help work with them to understand what potential solutions might exist. I think if you start there, instead of, hey, let me tell you about my features and benefits, you're going to be much better off, right? Typical salespeople want to come in and talk about the things that they're good at. Hey, let me tell you, we use this... Um, Boy, and I know nothing about website design, so it'll sound bad, but we use this uh, scrum mentality and it makes it really fast and we're really dynamic and we can do all this fun stuff and we can, we can print out new wireframe diagrams in, 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 in minutes. Don't do that. Spend time talking about what their problem is. Help them go, wow, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know what? I think I've learned something today. You can help your customers that way, your prospects that way. You're going to stand out differently than everybody else that's strictly talking about how, how they do stuff. I think that's, yeah. for, first and foremost, that's, that's the one I do. Okay. Um, so ask questions. Ask questions. A absolutely. Ask questions. Ask questions. Um, we have a rule in Sandler, right? So there's a lot of Sandler rules. Somebody asked about a book. Um, I, We'll give you our contact information. I'll, I can give you a, a, a bunch of books. It depends on which, which, which kind of scripts and things like that that you'd want. So Carrie, I'm happy to share with any, any kind of script, any kind of books you want, to, you want to hear about. But ask questions. In fact, in Sandler, we have a rule, answer every question with a question. Right? Too often we mind read. We think we know what the answer is. And so we respond accordingly. Ruth Ann, I, I call you up and I say, Ruth Ann, I need a, I need a website. Uh, mine's really junky, right? And you think, okay, and you start talking. Well, I might think it's really junky because um, I don't like the color. And you're looking at it and saying, well, there, I need four clicks to get to a specific spot as a customer. Well, I don't care about that. If you start talking about that component, I'm going to look at it like I'm a deer in the headlights. I'm going to be lost. You have to know that what I cared about was that I thought the colors were stupid, right? So I think that's the big thing. It's that keep asking questions until you get to what the real problem is. Don't assume you know it. Um, Sandler has a bunch of rules, sales rules. We have a rule of three plus, right? Three plus is whatever the problem the prospect brings you is never the real problem. You have to ask at least three questions on that vein to get to what the real problem is. So Ruth Ann, let's try, you wanna try role play Ruth Ann? Oh, sure. Let's try role play. I know nothing about your business, uh, relatively speaking. You're a typical prospect. Bring me a typical problem a typical prospect brings. Okay, um, so hey, Mr. Kelly, um, I'm Ruth Ann with Acme Company and my website, hasn't been touched in five years. It's very outdated. I need some help. Wow. Can you help me get a better website? 
You know what, Ruth Ann, I, I, I don't know. I have to know a little bit more about you, a little bit about what you're trying to do and make sure that I'm the right fit for that. But when you say it's really bad and outdated, what do you mean? Well, no one's touched it in a really long time and the colors are way off and the it's customers got outdated it? images. What's you that? mean customers haven't seen it, touched it, or you mean like a designer hasn't seen it and touched it? A designer hasn't seen it or touched it. We're okay. not maintaining our website the way we should. And do you think customers aren't, and, and, and so I, I, I guess I'm confused. You think because of that, customers aren't coming to you. Is that, is that what you mean? Correct. How do you know? Well, because our Google Analytics data is down and we're not getting the hits that we want. And we can tell when they land on a certain page, that they're not clicking in the area we want them to. So we really want to. When a prospect clicks on the website, how often do they then become a client? Is that very often or is it just once in a while? It's only once in a while. As a matter of fact, some people get to the home page and don't even click through further. If, if they were to click through and it was perfectly designed, do you, do you think you would get more clients? Yes. Really? How, how many? Like one or a lot? I don't know. Well, I'm not really sure, but I know we'd be getting more than what we have now. So two or three more a month? I don't, is that? Possibly, but probably more than that. What's, what's the average client worth? Well, um, when they click through and actually purchase from us, it could be anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars. So you're talking three, three to $6,000 extra a month at a minimum, if, if things were working the way it should be. Correct. I, I don't know your business at all, Ruth. And is that a lot of money? Is that worth doing something? Well, yeah. Well, okay. I just, I don't, I don't know. How much time do you spend fooling around with this? Do you spend a lot you of mean, time worried about the website? Is it taken away from everything else you do? Well, it's been on the back. It's been on the back burner for a really long time. We know we need to make it more of a priority. So why now? Well, because as you know, with the advent of COVID, now everybody finds people online. So it's okay. very important for us to have a better website presence on online because that's where people are finding us. Okay. Out of role play, right? Did I, did I ever really answer any question you gave me? No, and I don't even know. No, but you made me think about more the behind the scenes reason of why I'm coming to get a website. Yeah, and obviously we would have spent more time and I wouldn't have cut you off so quick. I would have kind of let the conversation develop more, right? But I would have, I would have been really focused on, is this, a, is, is this an important issue for you or not? Right, and I purposely asked her, well, why now? Yeah, it's been untouched for years. Why now so important? What are you going to tell me? You're going to say, oh, it's because of COVID. I'm worried, about, I'm worried about COVID and what it's doing to my business. And I've got to find a new way to get new business. And yeah, yeah, three, three six thousand dollars more a month. That's a lot of money, right? Who's expressing the emotion? Am I getting emotional about it or were you? You were. The client. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's what I want, right? I want to see if there's that emotional connection to what you're trying to do. Because I know if you're going to make the change. There has to be that emotionally compelling reason, compelling reason to do it. And I'm Great. only going to find that out by asking questions. You know, we, our prospects very, believe very little of what we tell them. They believe just a little bit of what we show them, right? They might believe Google analytics or any of that stuff, but you know, they believe a lot of what they tell themselves. Right. And so if they say, Hey, this is now a big problem. Let me explain to you why it's so, such a big problem. I don't have to tell them that. And I don't have to worry about whether or not mm -hmm. they believe it because they're gonna believe it because they've discovered it. So if you want going all the way back, if you wanna sound different than everybody else, help them discover that kind of stuff. You'll sound different. Good point. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, absolutely, good point. 
very good point. Yes, it makes great sense. So one, just let's, we have to wrap this up. So I have one final question and it's in regarding to actually closing the sale. So, you know, we've been through the questions, you know, we found our prospect, we've been through the questions on the phone. How do we take that next step from them discovering what their true issue is and closing them on signing with us as the agency of their yeah. business? Yeah, got it. Um, so you can you can get you can get tons of books out there, right? That talk about how to close a deal. The simple answer is just don't don't leave till they say yes. Okay, really? now I'm, now I'm <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> of course, that's not the answer. So let me ask you a question. Within let's 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 go back to our role play, except that it, it was reversed. And let's just say that you and I did a great discussion around pain, and we both got to the point where I said. Uh, you know what, this is costing me a lot of money. COVID's important. I'm worried. We've got to get this fixed. And then you said, well, Steve, that, that makes sense. I think I got it. You know, from a budget perspective, what were you thinking? And we have a budget discussion and I say, I think I can, I think we can afford, you know, uh, a, a $20,000 upgrade to, to the website. That's what I've got in my budget. I think that's what we can do. And we have that conversation, right? And then you say, hey, Steve, how are you going to make this decision? And I said, well, and it's going to be partly on price. It's going to be how fast you can do it. It's how I, how I, how we've connected. And yes, I'm the decision maker. I'm going to make that decision. And, um, and I, I'm really going to base on those factors. Up until that point, within, if you've done your job well, and you've, you've gone through the kind of training that we're talking about, um, you won't have told them really much about anything that you do yet. You haven't, what we call spilled the candy in the lobby yet. You haven't told them all the stuff that you're going to do. But once you've qualified them on pain, that they have pain, that they are willing and able, and that they're going to make a decision, then you're ready to talk a little bit about what it is you can do for them. And you're going to address just the problems that, you, that, you, that, you, that we talked about. You're not going to bring in other things that we haven't talked about. You're going to bring just those problems in that we talked about, and you're going to one by one explain how you're gonna solve those problems. Now, the budget side of it, you know what my budget is, it's $20,000. You would have asked me, Steve, if it's a little more than 20,000, what are you gonna do? And I would have said, well, if it's a little bit more, I'll take, I can find it, but if it's much more, I'm done, I can't do it. So you'd know where your price would have to be. So let me ask you a question, if you know what the problem is, We've both kind of aligned on what a solution at a very generic level looks like. We know how much money we're going to spend and we know that I'm going to make the decision. And you now have the opportunity to put your proposal together to come back to me. What's the likelihood that your proposal is going to address my real pain, that it's going to be within my budget and it's going to be directed to me? How likely are you going oh, to correct pretty your high. So, and if it hits all those things, how likely am I to say, Oh yeah, this, this is perfect. This fits exactly right. Right. You're very likely. So if you focus on pain budget decision first, before you spill the candy in the lobby, and I saw Dell recommend, remember spill, spilling candy. If you do that first, if you really qualify them really strictly, if you spend your time on qualifying them, right. Before you, give them a proposal, your chances of them accepting the proposal are pretty high. And at that point, the hardest clothesline I teach my prospects, my clients to use is, so what do you want me to do now? If you've done all that stuff well, the hardest line you should ever have to give is, well, okay, what do you want me to do now? Right? And that's really the key. That's how you know you've done. That's how you know you've gotten there. Mm -hmm. You've done your homework, right? Is, is when you get to that and you almost don't even need the proposal. It's, it's more of a confirmation of what you've already agreed to. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Great. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another great sales line. Does that make sense? Well, yes, of course. So well, that's my, uh, that's my transition budget. line. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. What were the three things you said? Pain, budget, and something else. Decision. I always decision. qualify somebody, do they have actionable pain? Do they have okay. pain you can solve? Are they willing and able 
to make the investment that you feel is appropriate for you to work with them? And are they going to make the decision in a way that you're comfortable with? Now, none of that's easy, right? We walk into every sales call that we make with our parent on our shoulder, right? And our parents on our shoulder whispering in our ear saying, you, you can't talk to them about money. Don't, don't talk to them about money. It's not appropriate. Or, you know what? You really need to get this deal. Don't ask them that question. It's okay. You can wimp out on this one, right? We have that little chirping in our ear. And if we're not careful and we don't have that abundance mentality, that chirping, we, we skip over steps that we should skip over things and think, well, if I just get the proposal to them, that's going to make the difference. And more times that, that confuses the issue more than clarifies. Gotcha. And, I, and I'm not going to ask if that makes sense. No, that's okay. That's okay. We actually probably could talk about this another hour, but we need to start wrapping it up. So if anyone has yeah. any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. But Steve, if anyone wants to get in touch with you and pick your brain, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, thanks, Ruth, and a couple different ways, right? So you can email me. We'll send out the, the contact information. You can email me. Best way to do is connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, Steve Kelly, I'm out of Pittsburgh. I'm in the same area as Ruth Ann is. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I am part of the Sandler Sales Training Network. I saw we have people from all around the world. Um, there are most likely a Sandler Sales Training person in your area um, that would be happy to have a conversation with you. Tell them I sent you. It'd be nice of you to do that. But happy to have a conversation with anybody that wants to reach out and and just talk a little bit more about it. Great. Thank you so much for being with us today. This was very valuable. Thank you for sharing all of your insights and the information that you have. Just a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate you sharing that with us. I am Ruth Ann Bowen with East Camp Creative. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And please reach out to me as well. If you want to visit our website, you can go to eastcampcreative.com. We'll see you there. Thanks for joining us. Thanks everybody. Have a great weekend or midweek, whatever it is. <laughs>